everyone. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Web Alley beyond WGAG and not to be that person, but I am that person. It's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Compliance is a word we all just stick on it. You know, like, are you compliant with WCAG? Um, and when I say Web Alley, I know that's going to flag a bunch of people. Is like, is that A11Y? Uh, yes, it is. So a shorthand for accessibility, which is a 13-letter word. Pretty good for Scrabble, if you ask me. Um, but it's not very accessible. <laughs> so uh, Alley gets you a way to take the 11 letters between A and Y and just be like, there you go, Alley. It's accessibility, but with only two syllables. Today's objectives. Um, if you've been to one of my presentations before, you know I love this screen, uh, but oh boy. Uh, we're going to do introductions, which as always is going to be about me. Uh, then there are just so many things. <laughs> this is a really jam-packed deck, so we're going to go in pace. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll have time for final thoughts and Q&A, because honestly, I love the Q&A, but I had a lot of things I wanted to talk about today. So. Some of it may be familiar, and honestly, if I could stop saying the same things over and over again, that would be great. But progress is being made. So, about me. My name is Jessica Chambers. I am a senior customer success engineer. That's a fancy pants way of saying I'm part of the customer success team. Uh, we're the people who, like, make sure you get what you need out of our product. Um, but I'm also more technical than most of them. Uh, I'm also Silktide's accessibility officer. Uh, so I've worked at Silktide for 11 years now. I know, every year it just gets longer. Um, and my one claim to fame is that I was immortalized as a minor character in a video game. And since people keep asking, it was World of Warcraft. And she's still there. As might have been mentioned, it is my birthday. <laughs> this is an image from a game called Portal. It's worth noting that Portal came out in 2007, which is 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, because I'm old, apparently, this was the first thing that popped into my head. And I was like, wow, that's really sad. Uh, so for those of you who recognize the weighted companion cube, you're my people. Uh, but in the meantime, one. Be nice to me. It's my birthday. That's like the rule, right? And two, as was pointed out, could you think of something better to do than what you actually love on your birthday? <laughs> you know, like I know a bunch of people said to me, they're like, so not only are you at work, but you have to give a presentation. And I was like, yeah, but like, this is my calling. <laughs> it's like, I'm actually excited about this. So let's talk about accessibility beyond WCAG. We are starting with Nancy. Um, I recognize that apparently Nancy comics are not much of a thing here per se in the UK, but they're like they're from well beyond my childhood in the US. Uh, so anyway, this is a comic showing Nancy using a laptop looking angry. She says, reading social media all day is making me grumpy. A voice off screen says, why don't you go outside? Nancy says, fine. In the final frame, Nancy sat outside, still with her laptop in a lush green environment with the sun shining. Nancy still looks angry and says, now there's glare on my screen. <laughs> I'm sure we can all relate to Nancy. Glare from the sun can be a problem, especially on mobile phones. And in fact, that's considered a situational impairment. You know that thing I love to drone on about? Uh, like, we all experience similar barriers and complications. So we're looking at the same slide again, and the title here says, let's get a bit meta, right? So you might have noticed that I described the comic on the previous slide so that people who can't see it still know what the content was. I don't want to get too into the weeds on audio descriptions and transcripts, but I want to make you aware of what is a requirement versus what we think you should do. This is a screen grab from our Don't Be Afraid of WCAG video. It's one of the first ones I ever made. Uh, and I kind of like it, frankly. Uh, I was making the joke that it's not a set of rules, right? It's They're more like guidelines, which is a reference to a famous Disney movie. So our animator created this image of the fake script with a cartoon pirate inspired by the one who says the line. Now, it's on the screen for a matter of seconds while saying, insert a witty pirate joke here. But should we explain it in the transcript and risk the wrath of Disney? Right? You have to weigh whether or not it matters. Like, 
But here's the thing. Audio description is an art. I can't stress this enough. It is an art form. Done well, it's shockingly amazing. Um, the best example I ever found is from Disney. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for Frozen audio description, right? Because this is the trailer. It's honestly stunning. Uh, but... <laughs> WCAG requirements don't insist on a full transcript until AAA, right? And there's plenty of problems trying to crowbar audio description into videos that don't have enough pauses in them to fit it in, right? And WCAG allows exceptions, right? Like, if you don't have the pauses, then they don't allow you to, like, use it. Or rather, they allow you to not do it, which is... You know what I mean? Like, it's, just, it's that frustrating thing. AAA asks for extended audio descriptions, and then you can actually force pauses in to do the descriptions. Like, all of this is kind of, like, brutal as far as I'm concerned. Right. Transcripts, on the other hand, these are good for, like, everybody. I can't stress this enough. Transcripts are not a requirement. At AAA, they become a full requirement. But transcripts allow deafblind people to know what's in your videos. And it's the only way they have. So I'll never fully understand why audio description gets rated more important and put in at like double A when I think transcripts should have been there from the outset. Right. So what I have here is actually an example from our Silk Tide Academy. Right. Um, and this is about how it goes. Right. It has the name of the speaker and then visual descriptions. So what if your site has 10,000 pages? The visual is a blob representing 10,000 pages of peers, right? What if your site has 20,000? Or, uh, sorry, I'm misreading my own things. Or 200,000, the blob inflates. What about a million? The blob's now so large it's pressing up against the screen, right? So you're not missing out on what everyone else is seeing. Right. The, the principle of a transcript is that you need to make sure if there are visuals, especially visuals that are entertaining, you know, or add something to it, that you bring that in. If you think of why we use alt text, it's a similar thing. You know, like you could argue that like the things and this doesn't say pop, but I swear they make pop noises. Yeah, you know, like it does whether or not like that matters. Yeah, but I think it's good to be in, as inclusive as possible and recognize that, you know, sometimes, especially if you're making jokes, that including everyone in them is is important. Moving on, we're going to talk about the concept of shift left. Uh, because I'm finding the more that I talk to people, they don't think about it the way I think about it. So shift left. The idea with shifting left is that you take accessibility and instead of doing it at the end, which is where I guarantee you it will be the most time intensive and most expensive way to do things pretty much on every level. You push it earlier in the development plan. Now, this is where most people think it's supposed to go. Right. I've moved it there. I've done my analysis. I do my accessibility thinking and then we wireframe design, development, test and launch. Right. But it's not really how it works. Accessibility needs to be through all of it. It should be there at analysis. It should be there when you're doing your wireframing. It should be part of development, right? And beyond, because as people add things, you still need to be worrying about whether or not it's accessible. Things change. You know, the way we interact with the web changes. And you need to have accessibility be part of the process for the entire thing. And yeah, that means that a lot more people need to know about it and need to know some basic fundamental rules of how to make the web more accessible. There's a quick rule I want you to remember from now on. It's called you break it, you bought it. And I'm sure that like most of you have encountered this. I know I have like there's signs, you know, you break it, you bought it. If you touch anything in your website that used to have a default behavior, say from the browser, you are now responsible for it. My problem is simple. WCAG says that, right? So for example, the focus states by default, I think in Chrome are blue, right? Now you could have a blue background website and therefore they don't show up. And I can't believe I'm saying these words, but there's a chance you would pass the current version of WCAG <laughs> because you haven't touched it right? It's automatically generated by the browser, right? 
and it's still totally inaccessible. This is part of the reason I wanted to talk about Beyond WK, right? Because you can cheese these rules all day long, and it doesn't mean you're doing it right. You know what I mean? So, the things to think about are if you, say, redesign a scroll bar or you anything like that that you change from the default behavior you are responsible for... Uh, but honestly, I think you should be considering when those things should happen anyway. Yeah, uh, because we're going to talk about focus states again, and that's why it's a bugbear for me. Moving on, let's talk about how size matters. I knew we love to make this joke. But it does. So this is tap target size. Again, I swiped this from the W3C directly. This is there. This is good. This is bad screen, right? This bothers me, particularly because when you take it off their website, it's about this big, right? And you're like, oh, that doesn't seem so bad, does it? But that's because I don't know about you, but I can't in my head be like, this is how much 20 pixels is, right? Like, that, it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, also, I can't visualize, so it really doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, but this is what it looks like. This second one, this should also pass. That's the 24 pixel requirement. This should also pass as well is 20 pixels with four pixel gaps. That's how small it is on your screen. And they're saying this is good enough. It's not. The other thing that bothers me in the like, there aren't any requirements for this and it's just not covered is font size. When we talk about color contrast, they say things like, you know, you need this contrast for small font or this contrast for large font. And you know what I mean? Um, but there is no fundamental, your font can't be smaller than this. <laughs> um, and over the weekend, I was reading uh, a fairly famous <laughs> accessibility professionals blog. Um, and this is what it looks like on my screen. But it's worth noting that uh, my phone is substantially smaller than these because um, I have an iPhone you know, 12 mini because I like small phones. Uh, so that those links, like, you know, the if your accessibility solution can be turned on and off, you still get an accessibility problem, which is, you know, a really good link. Um, it's like this big. I, I had to pull it closer to my face to read it. It was a whole thing. Uh, and I was like, really? Uh, so I screenshot screenshotted it immediately, being like, that's going in my deck, because I kept thinking I needed to find a good example of it, and then I just stumbled onto one. And that's my point. It's everywhere. <laughs> These are people who have been doing this for 20 years and are still on occasion falling prey to it. You know what I mean? Friction matters too. So, things that are covered. Autocomplete, particularly on mobile. Man, this matters. And it is a requirement for WCAG, right? It's pretty simple. I think we talked about it a bunch of times. Happy to talk about it again at length, just not today. Um, so if you set it up, you get that magical effect of like, you know, pink, and it fills in your name and email and everything. It's great, right? Love it. Um, but as I said, WCAG requires that. What they don't require is input mode. Now, if you're entering a phone number, you obviously want the keypad with the relevant buttons. You know what I, mean? like, I don't want my full QWERTY keyboard. Right. What I want is to be able to be like, you know, plus four, four, whatever. Right. Or plus one, whatever. Uh, and this one's called tell or telephone. Uh, so it gives you plus asterisk hash, like all the things you need, all the way style international numbers. You know, and I think this is great. Uh, the one on the left is Android. The one on the right is from iOS because uh, they are a little bit different, but I think it's worth seeing them both. So you can be like, yeah, they do essentially the same thing, right? Uh, this is email, right? And one of the things that changes here is that all of a sudden we've got a prominent at button in both of them and the dot. 
right? So when you think about it, like if you're adding your email, either prompting me with one that it knows I have, right? <laughs> Which is potentially useful. Uh, being able to type it in and then have the ad and the dot and whatnot just be right there instead of having to look for them, you know, is kind of awesome. I think the less friction you have, uh, the higher your form completion rates are going to be. I'm pretty sure they can prove that. Uh, the happier users will be. Uh, and honestly, I think about people with cognitive burden and fine motor controls. Like, there are days I wish I had never made Jessica Chambers at gmail.com my email address because it's so long. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, all of these things are things we need to think about and think about ways to make it easier. So let's talk about focus states. Like I said, someday this will not be my broken record moment. So we're going to go over a few things that some of you may remember, right? Hover is not focus. Hover is when you put your mouse over something and it changes, right? Everybody sees hover. We're all familiar with it. Hover is amazing. I love it. Everyone loves it. The focus only shows up when you're not using your mouse. Right? So, simplest way for you to see this is just open a web page and hit your tab key. That's the focus state. Right? Focus states should be bright, contrasting colors. They should be really obvious where you are on the page. I will stress this, I think, until I'm in the grave. <laughs> Um, these are screenshots from our Don't Be Afraid of Keyboard Navigation video. The point I was making here is that the bright contrasting color is the key. It is not about being pretty. It's about being functional, right? And I remind everyone, no one sees your focus states who doesn't need them, right? So this idea that like they don't look good and you're worried about how people are going to feel about it, trust me, the people who want the focus states are not thinking about that. Yay. So, we are going to do one of my favorite audience participations, because I want you to think about this. I want everyone to close your eyes. You just have to trust me if you haven't done this before. Keep them closed. Right, open them. Where are we on the page? This is why it matters. If you get distracted, if the phone rings, the doorbell goes, how would you know where you are, right? Don't make this hard. My complaint is simple. The minimum should be this. Not whatever nonsense WCAG is currently, or W3C is currently putting into the guidelines, right? Stop allowing for all sorts of exceptions so designers can put in tiny little lines or dotted lines or drop shadows and all that stuff. I hate it. It needs to be clear. Right? It's not about being pretty. Yeah. And I know I drone on about this all the time, but it matters. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do as homework is to go to your website, load it up, put your finger on the tab key, because trust me, I can't find it with my eyes closed. Close your eyes, hit the tab button a whole bunch of times, right? And then open them and see if it's obvious to you where you are. You'd be amazed at how much you might learn from doing that. So now we're going to talk about what I called keeping the focus, because there's a couple different things I want to talk about here. Um, so first off, in 2.2, we are adding um, uh, the, the check for obscured focus states, right? Now, the language bothers me. What it really amounts to is that, like, your focus state shouldn't have anything over it. You know, or hiding it in some way, because it makes it hard for people who need it to know where they are. Right. And potentially to read it. Uh, this is a live site. I took this screenshot this week. Um, so you can see that this is a carousel. And when I selected the first one with my keyboard. The instructions or manual things for the, the carousel covered up half of it. And honestly, it's quite hard to read behind it, uh, which is really not good. Um, this is an older one. I have not checked. I know who this is. <laughs> I haven't checked to see if they've resolved it, but I just thought it was such a good example of their cookie banner hiding their focus states, right? Again, they're 
currently is no percentage or rule or anything that says how much you can obscure and still get away with it. Because AA says you can have some obscuring, but not full. What does that mean? Um, sticky menus do the same thing. You can see this is covering up the top half of this logo and thing. And again, I'm going to take this moment to be like, that to me is not a good enough focus state. Stop doing these things. I don't want to see one and two pixel lines ever. Do better. For the sake of not calling people out. Oh, I see some of you know who it is. Uh, for the sake of not calling people out, I have blanked out uh, the start of this URL, but I needed it to be there so you could see what was going on. Uh, that arrow is pointing to where my focus state is. It's hidden underneath the uh, cookie banner, right? But you can tell based on the URL, like the information for business, blah, 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 taxi licensing, that is obviously in that section, the business information and support, but I can't see it. I was actually shocked when it just disappeared. And I was like, oh, <laughs> stop doing these things. This is another example I want to bring up. If you do this, right, where you have a big cookie thing, like a pop-up, and you kind of try to gray out what's behind it, you must, cannot stress enough, must use a keyboard trap on the cookie pop-up. So what you need to do is make it so that you can only get to accept cookies, decline, and the X, right? Because that way you ensure they can deal with that thing and then open up the site. If you can tab past those and then not visibly see that your focus is now behind it somewhere, that's atrocious. <laughs> Man, did I see this a lot. Yeah, This is the kind of thing you don't want to find on your own site. But this is part of the reason it's so important that you do load your site. Maybe load it in an incognito window so that you won't have the cookies set. So you'll get the cookie banner and can see what it does. Yes, I'm droning on about cookie banners. There are options here. I'm not saying you can't use them. I'm saying that you've got to look at what the options are. Right. And I'm not huge on promoting specific cookie banners, but my colleague sent this to me a while back. Right. Because these were the available options for something called cookie bot. You see the one that's highlighted called push down an edge to edge banner, which slides in from the top, pushing the content of the page down. See what I mean? <laughs> not sitting on top of it. Problem solved instantly. They also have an overlay option, which is that this, right? Except there specifically says this banner type essentially forces the visitors to submit their consent choices before being able to interact with the page. So I think they're forcing the the issue. So I don't know if they're good, honestly. I, it's not like I'm saying, hey, you should use this one. I'm saying if they have these options, maybe others do too. And if they don't, then maybe you do want to come back to Cookie Bot. Uh, like I said, feel weird about promoting them, but when you do the right thing, people should notice. Next up, focus state should be consistent. This is not covered by WCAG at all, but I'm going to show you something and I want to see how you feel about it too. Uh, focus state should be consistent, also known as highlights, underlines, and borders. Oh my. Again, try not to call anyone out, but you might know who you are. Right, so this is the cookie banner. This is not bad, right? It's got a pushed out thing. So you're actually looking at the blue versus the white. It's decent. I'm like, well, eh, it is only one or two pixels, right? But it's not bad. So I was like, you get a pass for that. But then I kept going. And this is the search in the top right, right? It says, how can we help today? The second I put my focus onto that text box, it turned that hideous color of, I don't know what. Um, and I was like, okay, what? That has nothing to do with the focus states I was just seeing. Um, and when I moved the focus over onto the search button, which needs to be a button, so good on them for doing that, I get yet another completely different focus state. And I was like, what's going on? 
further down the page, I found this. You tell me if you can tell where the focus state is. For the record, it's in the center. Uh, but wow. <laughs> They're all different, and some of them are bad. And then it continues. Same page, further down. That same weird yellow has shown up again at the top of this. It's really, like, barely noticeable, but it's there. Um, and I know when I had this part, the local election results flagged up, um, it was... Oh, God bless you, whoever that is in the chat. I like that you changed it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, down here, we have local election results 2023, and there's this big black bar. Right. And I was like, mm, wow, you know, it's colored it. I can see where it is. I don't really personally like that. It's the same color. I find it a bit confusing. Uh, however, when I move to the next bit, this is literally the same section, you know, one tab down. And this hasn't bolded. This hasn't anything. It's just, you know, put that color around it. Um, and we can do better. Right. Like. It matters that they're the same so that as you're going through the page, you're not like, wait, where am I? What What's going on? You know, you need to set expectations and then carry them through. And yeah, I get it. Sometimes it's going to be hard because you're going to be facing situations where like the design is a little bit different. But A, talk to your designers. We're going to talk a lot about design. Uh, and B, like, you know, as I'm always saying, do better. Uh, the anxiety is real. That is my T-shirt for the day, too. No kidding. I want to talk about some things that happen that people don't often talk about. So, impulse buying. Drunk shopping is a $45 billion industry, and this information came from a few years ago, right? Really need to do some more research on this from now. Um, but when I was looking into this, the interesting thing was that Monzo, uh, you may have heard of them, they introduced a positive friction mechanic never heard positive friction mechanic before in my life that delays transactions made late at night so they can be reviewed in the light of day. That's their wording. They said they were doing this to help with impulse shopping that bipolar people like me do. <laughs> but I suspect it would help the drunk people too. Uh, because even if you're not intentionally taking advantage, some people are actively taking advantage. So we're going to talk about dark patterns also known as a-hole design. See me not saying the word, but you all know what it is. So, dark patterns. I love this image because uh, it is a hand, like a dark hand, with marionette strings leading to a different hand and prompting it to push a green tick box button. You know? um, and that's kind of what this is about. It's about manipulating people. There's a lot of different kinds of this, but I'm just going to cover a few for you so you know what they are and you can see them when you're out and about on the web. Disguised ads. This is a really simple one to understand. You see the pink highlights? You know, you're on a, a site where you're trying to download something and you've got start download. It's an ad. It is not downloading what you're looking for. Uh, sneak into basket. This one hurts me. Uh, you attempt to purchase something, but somewhere in the purchasing journey, this knight sneaks additional items into your basket, often through the use of an opt-out radio button or a checkbox on a prior page. It's worth noting that this is illegal in the EU, right? But American GoDaddy provides a perfect example that I think everyone should know happened. Buying domain names, they offer a get three and save 69% bundle, priced at $17. Seems like a good deal, doesn't it? The next page automatically adds privacy protection to your basket, priced at $7.99. When you get to the checkout page, it's now $154.31. They put two years of registration on there instead of the one from the original page, plus privacy protection, so $17 bucks became $154 in a couple of next clicks. That is terrifying. I have an example for you here. This was from a buying concert tickets <laughs> website. Um, and at the very bottom, in this privacy information, of all things, was a ticket special bonus, one-year subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. Right? 
And it blathers on about how it's a $12.95 like cent value, blah, blah, blah. But then at the end, it says, for your convenience, at the end of the first year of your subscription, simply pay the bill sent by Rolling Stone for the low renewal rate then in effect. If you don't wish to continue at that time, just write cancel on the invoice and return in the envelope provided. And the button over here says, I decline the bonus subscription to Rolling Stone magazine. And I'm sure they would argue that they were giving it to you for free, so why wouldn't you want it? But the question becomes, which would you even have noticed it? I mean, there's so many other things you got to be worrying about. Uh, Roach Motels. Uh, I think people around the world have heard of these now. Roaches check in, but they don't check out. Um, and someone found me a cartoon of a roach, like, at what looks like a hotel front desk, and it says, what do you mean I can't check out? What kind of a motel is this place? Uh, the best example I can give you here is that the idea is it's easy to sign up, but it's very hard to get out of it. Um, and a, the example I hear most often is that it's really easy to sign up for Amazon, like super easy. Uh, but if you want to delete your Amazon account, good luck, because it's buried and you have to do a ton of work to find those settings. And my absolute favorite dark pattern is called confirm shaming. Uh, this is trying to get you to do what they want based on making you feel bad. So it says, do you want to be notified when some of your favorite products go on sale? And the big blue button is heck yeah. And the no is nope, I'm rich. Moving on to positive things, checkboxes should always be positive actions, right? You saw how those were, like, you know, sus checkboxes, as far as I'm concerned. You know, like, I don't want your thing. Uh, they should be positive, right? Like, sign up for our newsletter or email me about weekly flyers, right? But it should be something that is clear. You click on it because you want it, right? While the EU and the GDPR tend to try to stop these things from happening, it doesn't mean they aren't everywhere in the world. Um, the one on the left says, we'd like to keep you up to date with updates relating to our product. Please untick if you would prefer not to get these updates. Totally banned by GDPR, but still surprisingly common. And the one on the right is an unticked box, and it says... I don't want to receive emails about MailChimp and related intimate product and feature updates, marketing best practices, and promotions for MailChimp. I shouldn't have to take that. That should be the default. So don't do that. Context is king. Uh, briefly, we talk about link text, right? The whole read more, click here thing. If people would stop doing this, I would never have to talk about it again. Um, but in this case, see, they're yellow, they're underlined, so, you know, they're standing out pretty well. But I want to remind everyone that the context is how Read More links work. You remove the context as, say, a screen reader looking at it, and you're just getting link, click here, link, read more, link, read more. Where are they going, right? This is a bad experience. And it's actually not that great for people with, like, vis like with visual acuity who look at your website, right? Uh, there was a study I read about where they asked people to find the size guide, and I swear to you, the results were, if it said click here, no one saw it, but if it said size guide, they all clicked it. So taking something like this, where you've got descriptions and then read more, and then just changing it to make the title above the description, the link. The other thing to note here is that this is what users expect. Trust me, they are clicking on your titles. You know, come to Silk Tide, use our analytics and our frustration, and man, you will see it. You know, this is what they expect to be linked, not some read more thing at the bottom, which is kind of amazing. Directional language. Uh, so, <laughs> I couldn't wait to use this. Uh, just in case you aren't familiar, this is a scene from Captain America, the movie. He is a superhero, right? So he's super awesome and fast and buff and all those things. Um, and this is a soldier who is also running the same track in the park he is. Uh, but Captain America is lapping him on a fairly regular basis. And every time he comes up behind him, he's going, on your left, you know, to warn him that he's coming past. Uh, and it's 
pretty comedic. Uh, so <laughs> below, above, on the left, on the right, these kind of directional phrases are really bad, right? Uh, not just for the what could be perceived as insensitivity to anyone who can't see. That's not what I mean. I mean that once you say, well, I don't know, expand it, use reflow, and put it onto a mobile phone, the layout changes, and it's no longer on the left, on the right, things like that. So just don't do it at all, right? Don't use directional language. Zooming in on design. That was a zoom text joke. Uh, I really mean screen magnification options. Um, when I was at CSUN, this really opened my eyes, and so I wanted to share it with you. Screen magnification, which I'd seen in action uh, with one of my coworkers at one point, uh, is kind of fascinating. But the thing to remember as a designer, uh, Uh, is that when you've got a box, <laughs> this is what you see. So, like, uh, we WCAG allows for, I think, 200% magnification, but the reality is people go to 400%. And, like, you see about that much of the screen, right? And that is something you really need to think about, right? So, looking at this, maybe you're not thinking it's too much of a problem. But I want to ask you, if you were filling out this form... Would you realize there's a second column? So one of the best examples I can give you is one that was given to me, which is about switches, you know, and the relationship between them, right? So this is the kind of thing I've seen often. Like, here's your switches. Option one, option two, option three, whatever, right? Uh, but here's the thing. With that little tiny box, it's really easy to think that these two are actually related to option two and option five instead of one and four. Right? When you can't see the whole thing, we're losing context. Yeah, that context is thinking suddenly, like, you know, ties into everything, right? Things I don't fully understand about designers, but I'm going to point out it's about white space. I know calling it white space when it's like gray is weird, but. Um, the white space in between the two sets of things is actually quite small, but the white space inside, you know, the option and the thing is, is big. It's like more than twice the size of the one in between it. Um, and that actually makes things a little confusing. If you like having that much white space and plenty of designers do, right? There are better solutions, right? So you take this, put some outlines on it. Right. You could have boxes with drop shadows. See, people like drop shadows. Uh, you could do these pills. Right. Uh, you could do anything you want to separate them out. Right. So that it's more clear, like option one is in this space. Right. And the reason that matters, we're going to take a closer look at this, is because now when we look at that same spot. It's pretty darn clear that option two has a nothing to do with that switch. See? Little changes. Design. Shift left. See how it all ties together? So, we're going to talk about labels. And when I say labels, I'm going to tell you to think more like hints from now on. So, persistent hint text. That's the phrase. Hint text, right? It's giving me the information I need to know what I need to put in the form, right? So, if you want a date to be in month, day, year format, Americans, uh, yeah. then you need to be able to tell me that. Now, a lot of people do this, which is they use the placeholder text, which then disappears the second you put your cursor into the box, right? Uh, and this is a slightly different version where they've labeled it date and put the hint text in there and it still goes away, right? Other alternatives are to put the name date and then put the hint text under it, but the best solution, period, is what it's called, your hint text for what the layout you need is, as the label, so the screen reader can read it, and it's good, and it's there for everyone, right? Everyone can use this.
other solutions. This one's bad again, right? Search by city or postcode as the uh, placeholder text, so it goes away. Useless, right? Search by city or postcode above it. Search by city or postcode below it. Like, I don't know, design choices. It's not the end of the world. Uh, this one's called We All Float Down Here because I wanted a Pennywise reference. Don't do this. Uh, again, it's allowed, but don't. Um, floating is when you take the placeholder text and you just kind of shift it up a little bit. But this is where we fall prey to that whole there is no requirement on how big that font needs to be. So it tends to be really minuscule, and that's really not good for anyone either. So please don't think that this is the answer. What you should do is just keep it simple. What it is, what the format hint is, and just keep that as a label. It doesn't have to be complicated. If we just make the rules simple and say everyone should do it this way, it all gets better, doesn't it? Going back to our example site, we're going to take a closer look at that form. This is kind of what I meant about, like, how would you know, you know that there's a second column Right, like what is there here to prompt you to move further over looking for things? You know, it, it's just not necessarily there, right? It's like I don't see any reason I would be like, oh, well, obviously it must continue on that side. But the thing you should really be thinking about is mobile, because if you just made it a single column in the first place, then you know it's going to be there and look fine when it's on mobile too, right? It'll be the same. Yeah, and one of the things I thought was interesting was you see how close these are together, like postcode, company. Um, that could be confusing. Like, how would you be 100% certain that phone number was above the field rather than below it? Yeah, I mean, tough to know. Whereas this one, you see how they're separated out? My designer was changing slides, and you can tell, because now they've got some spacing, so there's less guesswork involved in what's related to what. They're cool like that. This is another thing I wanted to show you because it happens to me a lot. Um, so what's going on here is that this is the whole form, right? But you're not going to see the entire form at once in your phone. That's just not how it works. Right? Uh, this looks more like fig butt to me, right? Uh, so over here, I've got what you can actually see, right? So I got down to the postcode and find address, sort of. That's the top of the page, right? So I fill out the form. I get to the bottom. I click save billing details, and I'm clicking next, and I'm clicking next, and I'm clicking next, and nothing is happening. Has this ever happened to you? Is it because there's an error message up at the top that you can't see? Don't do this. Again, WCAG doesn't stop you, but this is annoying. If there is a problem at the top of the form, move people to it. Or give them some level of a hint down at the bottom so they're not just clicking next and not understanding why nothing's happening. This happened to me in March when I was trying to like check in for my flight. And then in the car, not kidding, <laughs> I got to listen to my boss go through the same form and then be like... Nothing's happening! <laughs> but I knew what had happened, so I was like, scroll up, something's wrong. Right? Just, ugh. So, my final thought. This one is from Teddy Roosevelt. I know, we're going back. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I've been thinking about this a lot, because I think he has a point. <laughs> yeah, um... I think the more that you can show your own passion and show people that it does matter to you, the easier it is to get them to listen and to open their minds and hearts and to get them to care. So a couple things I want to mention. Uh, we do now have a field guide for web accessibility for mobile screen readers. Uh, this is a screenshot from the PDF. Yes, I know. I hate PDFs, <laughs> but uh, the concept is pretty simple. It's filled with QR codes. Um, so you look at it, QR code, it'll take you to the correct page, right? And it walks you through what you need, like the basics of how to use each screen reader on Android and iOS, right? And then we give you like, uh, so 
there is this version, right? Which is lots of pretty things and birds tweeting and stuff. And that's the PDF. Um, and maybe if you get lucky on our next print run, you know, we'll have more. But my word, they were gone so fast at season. Uh, this is the email you'll get if you go to soaktide.com slash field guide or it's in the footer on the website. Can't stress that enough, right? It's in the footer. You'll find it. Um, the email looks like this, right? So it says, click the button to download your free book, Field Guide to Mobile Screen Readers. That gives you the PDF. There is also a text-only accessible version of the book, right? So click that link and you don't need the PDF. Right. That was one of my big things. I needed it. Uh, so you don't have to deal with the PDF. Uh, part of the reason I said we should use the PDF, even though I hate them, is that what their PDFs are good for is printing. So I was like, you can print it out like a book and then, you know, use it the way it was originally intended. Um, last moment for this is to remind you all uh, that there is a toolbar the Disability Simulator. Uh, it's just silktide.com slash toolbar. It's a plugin for Chrome. Uh, but the reason I recommend it to people isn't so much like showing you things like how blurry the web can be. Uh, it's that the screen reader simulator is a really gentle thing, right? Where it's like, let me give you some idea of how your website sounds, what it would be like to experience it with a screen reader without the learning curve that is involved in getting involved in any of the actual fully fledged screen readers. So happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day, everyone. Let's do Q&A. A couple of you distracted me with your messages. <laughs> right, I uh, will. Um, guess I think you've uh, you've definitely made people think and I, I love that session um as, as always some really really interesting and, and interesting thoughts that's come out of it i'm going to give people a few seconds to start put their hands up and I'll, I'll bring them in just want to cover a couple in the in the chat jess if i can um can directional language be used uh, in alt text I don't see why not right be like on the left is you know jessica and on the right is you know a beautiful vista of well my brain's trying to conjure something of like what if you were on some tropical island yeah the thing is like it's fine then right to be like describing the image you know but it's a different thing if you're trying to tell someone where something is on the page because those things move around and as an example for someone using a screen reader they have no way to move left left doesn't exist mm -hmm. You know, so it's really difficult to say it'll be on your left. And they're like, is it? Because I don't know where that is and I don't know how the page layout works. You know what I mean? So on that then, so how would you describe location on a page for systems guidance if you don't use directional language? That is. I think the only words you can use are top and bottom. Right. Okay. You could yeah. describe where it is. Uh, if you're big on Aria, I know not everyone is, uh, but as an example, like if you have done things like label certain navigation areas, you can do things like reference the navigation area. You know, like this is part of the top nav or this can be found in the footer. Right. But that is different than, you know, fill out the thing below or fill out like my favorite is fill out the form on the left. Because the second you put it into like Word or you shrink the screen, uh, Word on the phone or you shrink the screen or whatever, it's going to move and it might be below it and it's no longer to the left. So like it's just dangerous to use that kind of language to direct people. And again, it's it's lots of these things just aren't part of WCAG because it's, it's hard to cover everything. And it's definitely hard to like say you can't. You know, when then in say alt text, they have to be like, well, then there's an exception for alt text <laughs> when you're describing the image. You might want to be like, and in the background is, you know what I mean? Perfect. Thanks, Jess. One's just coming from Gabby. What is the deal with ARIA? Is it worth investing time in? Um, I stand by the joke I found from DQ, which was, 
don't use Aria unless you have to. Always use Aria if you have to, and you're doing it wrong. Aria is brutal. Uh, the learning curve on it is so hard, and it doesn't look like it should be. But whew, right now, there is not enough universality of support across the screen readers and browser combinations, right? They don't all support all of Aria, and they don't support it in the same ways. However, getting to know Aria now is a really good idea, because I do actually think it's the future. What it allows you to do is so amazing and so powerful. And we just kind of need the technology to like, whoop, you know, and then we'll be there. It's just not quite. And it can create situations where things don't work the way they should, even though you have coded them exactly right. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of it, even though it gets on my nerves and I consider it the bane of my existence. Uh, because I, I really think it's going to be the thing. And the stuff it allows you to do is really awesome. Fab. So that's all the questions, Jess, in the chat. So I'll just pause there. Does anybody want to come in um, off mute and, and ask any questions? I've got about five minutes left. Hey, I'm happy to see all this, like, you know, down with PDFs. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm fond of saying, there are no stupid questions. Like, if you're interested, I'm happy. You know what I mean? Like, if you've got questions, it means you care. And that's, like, awesome. Um, someone asked Perfect. about the best way for old text on graphs. Um, right. So <laughs> this actually came up yesterday. Um, pie chart <laughs> was part of a presentation a coworkers doing, right? And it had colors and then it had like a key with the colors. And I was like, wow, this is terrible. Even like, I'm a like full on able bodied visual user. And I was like, dude, I can't. I can't make sense of this. Um, and I was like, what you need to do at the very least is like over on the right, you know, every one of the keys put the percentage right in text so that like, you know, whatever it is, I can see it. And it matters less if I can match the colors visually. Um, also, you need to do things like patterns. You cannot just do color, like color, 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 right? They need patterns in them. And then you need kind of bigger boxes so that you can see the pattern and the color. Um, it's just one of those things where it can be tough. Um, one of the things I would recommend is that when presenting things like that, think about what the important information that you're trying to get across with the graph is, right? If you've included it, there's some reason, right? Like, what is it? And make sure you write that down. Yeah, because you can look at a graph and interpret it in lots of different ways, right? So if you just want to be like, look, you know, you can see the population growth between these times, you know, or you can see like, I don't know, a comparison of when people were getting reviews on G2, you know, you can tell that happened today. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, there will be information that you think is what's relevant. So make sure that you put that in text, either as a caption or as part of like the description of the information, uh, because uh, there's never going to be a perfect way to handle charts, graphs, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's part of the reason they can't be automated yet is because figuring out what the information you want them to know is, you know, is, is a thing a human does, you know, so yeah, giving them a rundown of what the salient points are, you know, is how best to get around it, in my opinion. Oh, yes, a, Gabby is dead right. Well. <laughs> that one has a C more. Oh, go you, Desiree, taking advantage of Global Accessibility Day to share the news. That's amazing. Okay. Issue with input fields is they put this is required. What is this? It's not specific enough to the exact field that it relates to. Um, yeah, so you you can't be like required fields are red, right? You can at at the top of the form 
right? You can write like required fields will have asterisks, but my suggestion to everyone, and again, not a WCAG thing, but like if you're going to have required fields, make all the fields required. Part of the reason you want to do this is because A, it's simplified, it's reducing cognitive burden, and I'm going to say it too, our little joke form had 10 fields. That's a lot for a single page, right? If you look at what they're doing and on the government website here in the UK, which is kind of held up as like the best example you know, of uh, accessibility, their forms don't tend to have more than two to four things on any step of it. And that's because they recognize that it is a cognitive burden. Interesting one that's just coming from Gabby there, just as well, saying visually impaired people. Uh, uh, oh, dude, tables, tables are... <laughs> tables are a nightmare. Um, the thing you have to understand about tables is that, like, again... WCAG allows for these exceptions, so they'll be like, well, if the table isn't complex, then you don't need to use, like, you know, the columns and t all the different kind of ways that you can, like, define things. Um, and uh, that's awful as far as I'm concerned, because it's really hard to navigate a table when you can't see, right? So, like, the more information you can give them as to what that table cell actually means, the better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, never for layout or for formatting pages. It should only be for tabular data. But even then, I would say, does this need to be a table? I come back to this all the time where I'm like, do you even need a table at all? Or is there a better way you can present this information? Yeah, you know, does it have to be a table? Yeah, because you'd be surprised. I see tables everywhere. And I'm like, why is this a table? <laughs> and they're like, well, we never thought about it. And it's like, you, you could just redesign this and it'd actually just be better for everyone. It would look good. Oh, yeah. Flowcharts and documents. Why? <laughs> oh, you guys are my people. And yes, Gabby's right. Half the problem is that finding things like that, like flowcharts at tables, yeah, put a table in a PDF and, you know, talk to me about how fun that was. Yeah. Um, it, it becomes a question of, like, this is the way you've always done it, but is this the best way, right? You can make relatively subtle changes in your design, you know, and they have mad implications for accessibility and any kind of remediation that needs to be done. Yeah, which is why, like, the shift left thing is, like, going all the way back, right? Yeah. Uh... Do, 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 do. Right. Taking that and going, we need to be here. Oops. Sorry, hit the wrong button. We need to be here. Right. Accessibility needs to be all through it. And it definitely has got to be in the wireframe and design and whatnot, because you need to be thinking about it early on. You don't want to be like the company I bumped into where they handed me their business card after saying they kind of didn't want to because they were uncomfortable. And you know why? It was because the color contrast in the logo was non-existent and they knew it. And everyone they handed it to at an accessibility conference could see it was too. Because <laughs> you just hold it up and you're like, oh my. And she was like, yes, I'm really embarrassed right now and looking for a new job. And I was like, great. But they didn't want to go back to the beginning to start over. And I'm like, well, you have to. <laughs> you have to. That's a good point. If you can explain it and you don't need in a step by step basis, do you really need a flow chart? OK, so scopes need to be used on tables no matter what. WCAG says it's only important to use them with complicated tables. This bothers me uh, immensely. I think if you just use like the call scope and. Great, my brain's going to fry. Uh, if you use scope on all tables you ever make, then you don't have to think about it, right? You don't have to sit there being like, do I need to use scope on this? If you just do it always, then it's not even a consideration anymore, right? And that's one of those things that actually makes a big difference as to whether or not the table is usable by someone with a visual impairment. But even then, like... 
could you provide them a summary of what the table's telling you, right, without making them navigate a table? Yeah, that text summary is probably a really good idea. I love how engaged you guys are. I think that's all of them, Jess, unless there's another one for them. No, Desiree's put an example in there. <laughs> uh, flowcharts. <laughs> so the thing about flowcharts is like, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I use them for jokes, right? Just like this. Like, do you want fries? Order fries. Uh, but the reality is, like, you could do that as, like, no, skip to, you know, section four. You could make it, like, a choose-your-own-adventure. The thing I'd ask you and anyone who likes flowcharts is, how do you describe it to someone else so that they get it? Because a complicated flowchart is really hard to, like, verbally describe to someone else. I know. I found one that I thought was really funny and tried to read it to my husband, and it was like, <laughs> because he's got to keep it all in his head, you know, to be like, okay, that went off there, and, and now we're going back, and you know what I mean? Like, there are things that are left over, you know, that we like, you know, that we go, oh, but I like those things, you know, I, I, I like my flowcharts, I like my tables, I like my whatever, right, you know, and part of it is like, well, is there another way to convey the same information? Yeah, you know, like. Think outside your little box. You know? And maybe that means you go talk to someone else to be like, hey, do you have suggestions for how we get around this? You know, and like maybe, you know, try them out. You don't only have to do one thing, you know. I'm not saying you can't have your flow chart. I'm saying maybe you have your flow chart and you have something else. You know, but the thing with the flow chart is at the end of the day, it's an image. How do you describe the image? You know what I mean? Think about your old text for that. How do you make that work? Yeah. Depending on what they are, some of them are just jokes where you can be like, every single thing leads to no. Except there's one, right? <laughs> you know? And like, maybe you don't cover everything that's in it. You just give them the gist of why it's funny. Yeah. But I don't know, like, Desiree, that's absolutely fantastic, honestly. Yeah. I, I love it when you can find something to drive the point home because then people get it. Um, and honestly, I think what you just pointed out, the whole, like, you know, here's your flow chart. Now read it to me. <laughs> How are you going to make that work? Like, I, I just find that funny because getting people to think it through, I think, is when they change their minds. You know, like, I think the experience of it is what changes things, which is why I'm like, dude, you know, check out the field guide, right? Because once you've used a mobile screen reader and we've shown you, like, what Skip to Content does, you're never going to want to be without it because now you know exactly how it feels to be without it. You know, you're like, oh, man, that sucks. And it's like, yeah, and that's one of the easiest things you can fix. How about you go do that? You know, but I can tell you what it is conceptually, you know, and we can talk about it in like an academic sense, but that's not really the same thing as experiencing it yourself. You know, and once you engage on that kind of level, it changes you. It forms new pathways in your brain and you're like, oh, wow, you never saw that coming. A few more comments, Josh, that, that, that's that gone in there. And I think I think you probably agree, as with everyone on the call, actually. And, and I really appreciate everyone's input in this as well, because it's great to it's great to get the questions for you, Jess, as well, but also, you know, for people to, you know, give their thoughts on what they're doing in their organisations, how it's helping, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because I think it's really, you know, it's really useful. Accessibility is a minefield and can be a minefield. Um, and I think that, you know, going through your presentations that you've done in the past and this one, Jess, and, and listening, um, listening to you and, and colleagues, I think is really, really important and informative. Um, you know, so I, I, I thank everyone for their input on that this afternoon. And obviously, Jess, of course, I thank you for, for delivering another great session on your birthday um, mm. as, as as well. Um, and like I said, you know, it's like we knew it was coming, Jess. You know, what more, what more better way to celebrate your birthday than like you said at the start, doing something that you love. So.
folks. Obviously, we really, really appreciate um, everyone's efforts this afternoon. Jess, yourself, colleagues at Silk Tide for delivering this session. You know, I think it's been really, really useful. The recording will be available, of course. Um, and obviously, thanks to everyone that's participated in the chat, giving your thoughts, what you're doing in the organisation as well. Hope you found it useful. Um, and yeah, really look forward. Look forward to the next one. Watch this space. So thanks, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.